back with blood vessels and the blood to the liver. The liver is extremely rich in blood vessels. It will get oxygenated blood through the hepatic artery. So first we have the hepatic artery. And it will be giving the O2 blood. Does anybody know where the hepatic artery comes from? No? Good guess, but not right. <laughs> That's all right. No, from the celiac. Do you remember the celiac? Not too well. Where is the celiac coming from? The abdominal aorta. Good for you. Now, the second blood supply coming into the liver is your hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein. And it will be bringing in nutrients from the stomach and small intestine. So we'll learn what it does with these when we study the liver itself. But I just wanted to give you the liver's blood vessels because it is so rich. Anybody know anybody who's had an accident and torn open the liver? Yes. Tremendous hemorrhagic situation occurs after that. All right, now let's um, look at some of the disorders of blood vessels. We've talked about aneurysms. Let's just look at one for a moment. So an aneurysm is a weakening and a swelling of a vessel wall, weakening, swelling of vessel wall. So we're just going to take an aneurysm of the aortic arch. So we'll have our normal arch. Something like this. If this is our ascending aorta coming out of the heart, giving rise to our aortic arch. And if we have an aneurysm, then it will look something like this with a swelling. So this will be my aneurysm. So we want to replace it. So we have to tie off the input, the output, and remove the aneurysm and replace it with a Dacron sleeve. Put it up here. Here. 
Here's my Dacron sleeve. So replace with Dacron sleeve. And they always give heparin, an anticoagulant, after they put in a replacement because we may have an unsmooth surface as the blood's going through and we may get clots. So you administer heparin to prevent clotting. Now another disorder with the vascular system will be hypertension, hypertension, which as you know is high blood pressure. Reportedly, one out of five adults in America have hypertension. So what is normal blood pressure? Hundred and twenty over eighty. What does that stand for? One twenty is the force of systolic pressure. Force of systolic pressure with ventricular contraction. And the 80 then represents the force of distolic relaxation as it's filling, force of distolic relaxation. filling, because we said that's what distally was. So then what is the threshold that lets us know we're in trouble with our blood pressure? So the threshold for high blood pressure is 140 over 90. That's the threshold for high or hypertension. So it's important that we learn how to reduce high blood pressure. All sorts of meditations that we can learn, our Tai Chi, our yoga. Now, one other, varicose veins for another disorder. Varicose veins is the swelling of veins in the lower extremity. The swelling of superficial veins. Swelling of superficial veins in lower extremities.
called varicose veins. What causes them? Obesity. You get all this fat up here, and there are no muscles contracting to keep those veins getting rid of the blood, so the veins swell. So obesity, pregnancy, I think we mentioned this already, that pregnancy can put pressure on the inferior vena cava, preventing all the blood coming from the lower extremities so the veins swell. And also hereditary. Maybe your mom or dad has varicose veins. Then you have to be alert that you might as well. How about age? Age isn't a factor if one's healthy, because to help those veins, you have to have good skeletal muscle in your extremities, right? So if, you, if somebody in your family has varicose veins, then you keep your legs, go on the treadmills, do all these good things. Aha. Anyhow, you can work to prevent them in most cases. But this gives you some examples of problems with veins. So we're going now to our lymphatic system. How many thought about your lymphatic system this morning? How many have ever thought about their lymphatic system? It's like everything else. You pay no attention to it till something goes wrong. So let's go to our lymphatic system. So what does it consist of? Lymphatic tissue. and lymphatic vessels. And what? Lymph. So what are our lymphatic tissues? We have the spleen, lymph nodes, lymph nodes, We've talked about a mass of lymphatic tissue that was sitting on our great vessels. What did we call it? Thymus. We'll see in a moment where our tonsils are. Have you heard of your tonsils? And so-called Pyers patches. Ever heard of Pyers patches? Never knew you had them? I'll show you a slide of them. Be surprised how many there are. So Pyers, after Mr. Pyers or Dr. Pyers, who first found them, Pyers patches. So these are all examples of lymphatic tissue. So let's take them one by one, see why we need them all. Why? Take the spleen to begin with. No, I tried at the Rotary Club one day 
to a big audience as big as this and asked how many knew what their spleen did. One hand went up. How many had had a spleen removed? <laughs> Same hand. <laughs> Has anybody in this class had a spleen removed? No, I've had it. the same thing happen in this class. I'll have one student who knows about the spleen, and strictly, you don't care about it till it goes wrong, and then you get it removed. So, spleen. It's the largest mass of lymphatic tissue in your body. So we'll start and give it that largest mass of lymphatic tissue in body. How big is it then? It's five inches by three inches by two inches. What does that tell you? Same as your heart, right. So you don't forget the size of your spleen. Or, talking to little kids, size of your fist makes it more tangible, or big kids if you want. Now, where is the spleen? It's in the upper left abdominal quadrant. What do we mean by that? Location? Let's put in our diaphragm. Our abdominal walls, our inguinal ligaments, and our umbilicus. So this represents our abdominal wall. And we just make it into quadrants. You'll find those going into surgery. You talk about this all the time. So we've got the upper. This is my upper left abdominal quadrant. Where are you going to tell somebody the appendix is? Lower right, sure. Right down here. But it immediately helps you define area with regarding underlying organs. So here we're going to have put in our spleen, but we're going to use the stomach coming through the esophagus here. And we have what's called the fundus of the stomach. It curves in this way. And then the stomach comes over onto the left side. So I first have put in my stomach. And the swelling here, sorry, is the fundus. And the spleen will sit between the diaphragm and the fundus. So it caps the fundus here. So you could quickly tell anybody, spleen is right here. <coughs> so in yellow is our spleen. Now, why do you have a spleen? What does it do for you? It's designed, as we'll see in a moment, to filter blood. How long did we say your RBCs last? 
120 days. So it destroys old RBCs. And it's the largest mass of lymphatic tissue in the body, so it's producing lymphocytes. So how is it built then to carry out these functions? It has a connective tissue capsule Our CT capsule made of collagenous and elastic fibers. Collagenous and elastic fibers. It's covered by a layer of peritoneum, which we'll talk about when we get to the abdominal cavity. Layer of peritoneum, which is a serous membrane of mesothelial cells. A serous membrane of mesothelial cells. Then to give internal support, it has trabeculae made of collagenous fibers that divide it off. These represent trabeculae. They're collagenous fibers. Just giving the internal support. As well as a reticulum, a reticulum means a network of reticular fibers. And we can just crudely sort of put in our network, because see, we've got to be filtering blood here. Blood's got to be able to go through. So, equal a reticulum. Many organs have reticulums, which is a network of reticular fibers much thinner than collagenous. And on those reticular fibers sit macrophages. So to destroy pathogens that may be coming in, hundreds of them, just illustrating a few. macrophages destroy pathogens and we're bringing in arterial blood
splenic artery. Splenic vein. So it can filter through this reticulum. But on the reticulum, we have what is called the white pulp and the red pulp. White pulp, just so when you're getting an exam and you see white pulp, you know immediately it's spleen and it's not a lymph node, for example. Red pulp. And the white pulp consists of a central artery surrounded by masses of lymphocytes. Just a characteristic feature of the spleen central artery and lymphocytes. So we'll see the white pulp up here in the cortex of the kidney, of the, it looks like a kidney, of the spleen. So if you're asked to point that out in your slide in lab, you go out here for it. So there's an example of what's called white pulp. The majority of the spleen is red pulp. And it consists of just blood sinuses with lymphocytes. So all of this will have blood with lymphocytes. No specific structure, but it gives you the basic fundamentals of how blood can come in, be filtered, and go out through the splenic vein. Now, in contrast, we have, let's just be sure I've covered everything on the spleen because it is important. No, that's fine. Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, again, are oval bodies, but it's much smaller. Small oval bodies. They can be anywhere from one millimeter to several centimeters. To put it something that you're familiar with, one millimeters can be the head of a pin. And several centimeters. Lima beans. Does anybody eat lima beans? Phew. Why don't you like lima beans? I could tell you stories about lima beans, but I won't. But <laughs> just giving you an example, perhaps you don't even know how big they are, but I was putting lima beans in here as an example for size.
And where do we find lymph nodes? They're usually in groups. I'll give you just a few. Location in groups. Let's give you the cervical, because most of you probably know those. Cervical lymph nodes. Obviously, they're going to be in the neck. They're going to be on the medial border of your sternocleidomastoid. So now you know your sternocleidomastoid, palpate it. Go to your medial border. You're not there. There you are. Do you feel lymph nodes there? Probably if you don't, you're healthy. Anybody feel big ones? You know when the doctor feels your lymph nodes when you've got an infection in your throat? Right? You don't get sore throats? All right, so this will be on the medial border of the sterno, just another way for you to review your muscles, sternocleidomastoid. Then we have the axillary group, lymph nodes. So you know where they are by the name. Why do I give those? These are in the axilla or armpit if you prefer. Because it's important that women know their axillary lymph nodes well. Because with breast cancer, the breast cancer cells will travel from the breast cancer in the lymph nodes, and the first ones it's going to encounter are the axillary lymph nodes. So we use the term metastasize, that breast cancer cells metastasize. They mobilize and go to the um, axillary lymph nodes, metastasize. To axillary lymph nodes. So women are always told to palpate their own breasts, to look for nodules, but you palpate your axillary lymph nodes as well. Because when they do a mastectomy, remove the breast, they have to take out where the cancer has traveled. You'll find that cancer travels all over. The brain gets lung cancer. We've had bra brains in lab were just filled with lung cancer, metastasized from lungs, gets in the lymphatics, goes to the brain. When you get into the field, you'll find how important it is to know your lymphatic system, what's draining what. So when you get abnormal enlargements. Let's just take one more, the inguinal lymph nodes. Do you remember studying the inguinal lymph nodes? Do you remember having N, A, B, E, L? What did L stand for? lymph nodes, so you know exactly where they are. You know where your inguinal ligament is, you come medially, and there you can palpate. Has anybody had an infection in your foot and get swelling in the inguinal region? Nobody? Nobody go barefoot when you were little and get stung by an ant? Really? Anybody grow up in Southern California? <laughs> we always had swollen inguinal lymph nodes, because we little kids with bare feet? No? All right, times have changed. Nobody <laughs> eats lima beans and nobody got an ant sting. <laughs> Modern population. All right, the inguinal lymph nodes, you know where they are and you're never going to forget your navel to remember the relationships here. So that gives us our location 
of lymph nodes. So now, let's see what their function is, and then we'll look at their structure. So, we've looked at function. Well, lymph nodes will filter lymph. What did the spleen do? Pardon? Filtered blood. A big difference between the two. We need these two filtering systems. The lymph nodes will produce lymphocytes. and will produce plasma cells, which we've had. So these are main functions, there are others, of our lymph nodes. So let's see how they're designed in contrast to the spleen. The spleen was filtering blood, we have to filter lymph. We have, make them big, just so you can see them, these oval lymph node. We're again going to have a connective tissue capsule. We're going to have some trabeculae. But what is different here is the arrangement of the vessels coming in and going out. In the large curvature here, we're going to have afferent lymph vessels. These are afferent lymph vessels. and we'll have efferent lymph vessels. E for exit, efferent. And again, we'll have a reticulum, because we're going to be filtering lymph. And we'll see an arrangement of lymphatic nodules where our lymphocytes are being developed. In these compartments, we'll have lots of them. So the lymphocytes then will come in and go out through the lymph vessels, and we'll have a constant source of lymphocytes being produced, no central artery. Now, what is lymph? Hmm? What do you think lymph is? Lymph is a tissue fluid. So it's mostly water, just like blood. It consists of water, proteins, sugars, and other things. And in some cases, fat. So the lymph vessels have to convey lymph, convey lymph,
And at the blood capillary level, certain amount of protein goes out into the tissues. At the blood capillary level, protein out to tissues. And then it's essential that protein comes back to blood, to blood vessels. If you get excess protein and it's not able to get back into the bloodstream, what happens? Death. So it's a terribly important relationship here that blood vessels and lymph vessels play with each other. They have to be permeable, these lymph vessels, to get the protein back into the bloodstream. Now the fat, for some reason, I don't know whether you've been taught this in your classes, why fat is so different in its absorption to get from the intestine into the venous system. It has its own pathway. And the fat is going to be absorbed in the intestine a whole different pathway. It's absorbed in small intestine. in lymph capillaries called lacteals, lymph capillaries, which are called lacteals. Lacteals collect in lymph vessels. And go into what's called a Cisterna chile. Cisterna chile. Ever heard of a cisterna chile? What's a cistern? It's a reservoir. A reservoir. Sorry. Reservoir. And chile will be the white fat. Thank you. And so we've already absorbed our fat into its own channels. And from the cistern of chile, the lymph with the fat will go all the way up to the base of the neck. See, I've got, here's my diaphragm, and I'll have my stomach here coming around into my small intestine. And the fat's being absorbed, and the cisterna chile will be, we'll just put it in here crudely. From it will come the thoracic duct, which will go along the thoracic aorta. This is a thoracic duct. Taking the lymph up to the junction of the internal jugular with the subclavian vein. So this is my internal my left internal jugular and my left subclavian. And the fat will be distributed into the venous system here. Isn't that an interesting pathway? Study the evolution of that. Why is that essential? 
to show you the importance of lymph, how much lymph is produced in a day. Here's your lymph. The thoracic duct carries 1,000 milliliters in 24 hours. It's a busy system here. Thoracic duct carries 1,000 cc's lymph for 24 hours. All right, we didn't quite finish our lymphatic, but let's look at slides. If you want to study fat absorption, you put in radioactive fat, you can collect it. That's what we did as graduate students. So you can get rates of absorption. First slide, please. This is just to show the underside of the liver to see how vascular it is just filled with blood vessels. What's this? What's that? No? It's gallbladder, right. Those in 131 had a whole lecture on how to take out gallbladders. In the next one. And this now will be the spleen. Here's the capsule. Here are the trabeculae. And it's a little hard to see central arteries. Sue, so the next one. This is reticulum. Reticulum, you can see how blood could flow freely through it. These are reticular fibers, very different from collagenous, and they'll have macrophages on them to clean the, the lymph. In the next one, here it's some very good, well-defined central arteries in white pulp of the spleen. You will not see anything like this in other lymphatic tissues, only the spleen. In the next one, and this is red pulp. There's just blood flowing in the venous sinuses with a reticulum in blue. In the next one, and this is a thymus gland. We didn't get to the thymus. It's clear to see because it has these so-called Hassel's bodies which are degenerating epithelial cells. Has anybody in any class ever learned what Hassel bodies do? I checked again this morning. We still don't know. But they're there. Next one. And this will be the tonsil. We'll have tonsil next time. It's got stratified squamous epithelium because the mouth is, the oral cavity is stratified squamous. None others. It doesn't filter. It just produces lymphocytes. Next one. These are Peyer's patches. Look at all those. They're in your ileum, the lower part of your small intestine. What in the world are they doing there? Lots of them. You might take a section like that and you say, oh, cancer of the lymphatics. But that's not true. This is a normal amount of lymphatic tissue in your lower uh, small intestine. Next one. And then this will show what we were referring to. Here are your inguinal lymph nodes down here in the groin. And then you have the aortic ones. Here's your cisterna chile, sometimes spelled with an I and sometimes with a Y, coming up to the thoracic duct, which will come into your uh, subclavian coming up and your internal jugular coming down. Here would be the breast. Here would be the axillary lymph nodes. And we have a right lymphatic trunk that we'll have to cover next time. Here are your cervical lymph nodes. But you see, it's an independent system all of its own, and yet closely aligned to the blood vascular system. All right?